The rest of you can open your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 1 through 4. That's Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. While you're going there, I want to welcome those who are online. I'm Mike Peters. I want to say hi to Rod and Ruth. We miss you. Um, I know that you really enjoyed the message two weeks ago because I quoted quite possibly your favorite Bible teacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's my favorite too. I learned so much from Martin Lloyd-Jones 35 years ago that I'm still living in today, and you can't say that about a lot of preachers. That's something to be said. And so, hi to Rod and Ruth. Hi to all your friends in Columbia, by the way. Um, that's not Columbia, Missouri. That's Bogota, Columbia. But the fact is, there is a Columbia, Missouri, and there is also a Paris, Missouri, a New London, Missouri, and a Windsor, Missouri. You don't have to leave Missouri to be international. I want you to know that. <laughs> just, just saying, okay, just saying. We've, we've got it all in Missouri. It's all here. Now, in the center of the United States, and we've got, well, every major city, at least the names, in our state. <laughs> and that's what counts, isn't it? Don't you think? Amen. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. What were we talking about? Okay. <laughs> Our series is Identity Matters. It does, doesn't it? Uh, I, I really do appreciate um, Neil Anderson. I almost called him Neil Armstrong. He's the guy that was on the moon. Neil Anderson's uh, book on identity is Christians. No one can consistently behave in a manner that is inconsistent with how he perceives himself. If you perceive yourself as just a sinner saved by grace, it's only a matter of time before you sin. Because then your idea of grace is to have sufficient power to deny your true identity. And that's really a terrible way to live the Christian life. It's, it's, a, it's a negative starting point, don't you think? But once you begin to realize who you are in Christ, you start at a positive point of your new identity. And from that strength of new identity, you're able to address the issues of sin that are relevant in our lives, that we do have to address. And so that's why we're on this theme of identity, and identity matters. It isn't just a, a concept, it matters in how you live your life. Identity matters. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue to talk about our new identity in Christ in light of the power of God that has come into us when we were born again, uh, and then how that has changed us and given us a new power and identity in Christ. And so the title of this morning's message is Living in the Freedom of Life. And it's based on the verses in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, which is right after that chapter 7 story where Paul talks about not doing the things he, he uh, wants to do and doing the things he doesn't want to do. And he ends that chapter by saying, who's going to set me free? And he picks it up in chapter 8, verse 1, and he talks about the freedom that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at the first four verses of Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's pray and ask God to bless the Word today. Um, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would give me words to speak. Give us all ears to hear your Word. I pray you go beyond the words I say and that you would enlighten our hearts. If the Holy Spirit doesn't enlighten us, all we have are words and and thoughts, but once you shed your light on it, it transforms us and the truth sets us free. I pray for the enlightening of the Holy Spirit to be in us and also in those who are online because you're not limited by space. I pray you open up our hearts and minds this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Paul starts out with a statement that I'm not sure we, we grasp. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation involves two things. It involves the verdict and the sentence. Someone even goes to court today uh, and they're charged with a crime. What happens is there's a verdict 
And once the verdict is rendered, then the sentence is passed. That's condemnation. There's two parts to it, the verdict and the sentence. Now, Paul, in Romans chapter 3, addressed the verdict side of condemnation. The verdict side has to do with guilt. And justification by faith through the blood of Jesus Christ removes our guilt. And so as Christians, when we talk about there's no condemnation, we almost invariably stop at the verdict. We say, I'm not guilty before God. I'm justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's true. But again, that's a half gospel. It's just half the story. It's removing the verdict, but leaving the person under the sentence. Now, the person who was under the sentence that came from the verdict of guilt was under the sentence of sin. So if you read on in Romans chapter 4 and 5, after Paul talks about justification in chapter 3, he talks about how sin came into the world through Adam and all then came under the judgment of sin. That's the sentence. We were put into the prison of sin. You're guilty. Here's your sentence. You're under the prison of sin. That's the power that's over your life. Now in chapter 8, Paul starts out by saying, there's therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Not only has the verdict been removed through justification, but now the sentence is being nullified because of the law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death that I was under. You see, we are so conditioned by sin that we believe it's a power, but we only think of the grace of God as a possibility. We say things like, you can be free if you want to be. We say that without even thinking about it, and we're saying that the power of freedom begins inside the person's will and their desire. But isn't the will itself bound by sin? I'm talking before salvation. That's what Paul's describing in Romans 7. Wasn't a problem with desire, it was a problem with the will itself. The will itself is bound by sin. Sometimes atheists can understand certain truths in the Bible better than we do. I know that sounds contradictory. Because they live in it. The atheist Frederick Nietzsche, he understood the power of sin in the will even though he didn't believe in sin. He wrote this. Anything which is living will strive to grow, spread, seize, become predominant. Not from any morality or immorality, but because life simply is the will to power. He didn't believe in sin. He didn't believe in God. But he understood from his experience that what motivated him was the will to power. I want to be in control. And he says that's true of everyone. That we do what we do, not because it's moral or immoral, but because there is in us a will to power. He doesn't recognize that the will to power comes from the power of sin. And that the will to power is the very essence of sin. The prophet Isaiah, that's a British name, Isaiah. I don't know where that came from. For those of you living in America, it's Isaiah. Thank you. I had to correct that before I went any further. <laughs> the prophet Isaiah said, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, it's referred to as the five I wills of Lucifer. Maybe you've never heard of this before. But it's in Isaiah 14, and it says this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you're cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. That's sin. It's at the will. 
Well, that last I will sure sounds reminiscent of the temptation of Eve in the garden, doesn't it? He knows you'll be like him. And he tempted Eve. And she saw that the tree was to be desired. Its fruit was to make you wise. That was the temptation. And then she took and partook. She reached up and partook. That's the will. Sin is at the most base level at the will. Even the atheist knows it but doesn't call it what it is. Nietzsche claimed to be a free spirit, but he died in bondage to a disease he contacted by sin. For any atheist out there listening, Jesus said the disciple is not above his master. If you're following Nietzsche, you're not going to have a higher destiny than Nietzsche. Sin controls the will, and you can claim to be a free spirit, but it will lead to bondage. That was his destiny. Nietzsche's will to power was bound by the power of sin. <laughs> now, to be free from the power of sin requires a greater power. It's the only way it's going to happen. You're not going to will yourself out of the power of sin. Paul is making it clear that the power of sin has been broken in our lives. Again, he's not saying we can never sin. He's saying we're not under the sentence of sin. That his power is broken. By the law of life in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 8 verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> what a great verse. It's also a very peculiar verse in the Bible. It's the only verse I know of where an impersonal analogy is used to explain the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere else, at least in my mind, where the Spirit of God is described in relationship to believers, it's personal, and he's personal. What's interesting in language is that in John's Gospel and in the Greek language, the word spirit is neuter and should have the pronoun it instead of he but it has the pronoun he in the scripture because the it is a person. But when we speak of the spirit as a law, as Paul is here, it kind of makes it an it. And that's why this verse is so out of the ordinary. It is, it is it, it's explaining the work of the spirit as a law so that we can understand something about the person of the Holy Spirit in us. You follow that? Now, when he describes the law of the Spirit, he's thinking of the law in the same way we would use the word law to describe gravity. He's not thinking of it as the law and the Ten Commandments and, and the Holy Spirit's going to give us a whole new set of commandments. He's thinking of it as the law as a, a law of gravity, a governing principle of the Spirit. And the reason I think he uses the word law here is because he wants us to understand that this is universal, it's true with everyone, and it's unchanging, it's always the same. It was a number of years ago, I remember a conversation I had with a person who wasn't living their faith any longer and was trying to explain to me why, and I was explaining to this person how you can walk with the Lord, and the individual responded by saying, well, you know, you're just one of those people that it works for. I am. I confess. <laughs> I'm one of those people it works for. But it works for everyone, and you can be one of those people too. It's a law. It's universal. It applies to everyone. It would be like saying, well, you know, gravity, you're just one of those people that it works for, you know? It's gravity. It doesn't really work for me. Because it's a law, it's universal, and it doesn't change. Well, you know, I went through a season in my life where I was really religious, but, you know, I've kind of outgrown that. What changed? Wasn't the Holy Spirit. You don't outgrow the Holy Spirit. He's unchanging. It's universal. It's unchanging. He's always there. It's the law of the Spirit. 
And it's true in every Christian. If you have the Spirit of God in you, the law of the Spirit has set you free <coughs> excuse me, from the law of sin and death. <coughs> I'm going to take a cough drop, and if my words sound jumbled, it's Ricolo's fault. Now, I want to really be clear. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. I'm not saying that the life of the spirit sets you free to live your life. So often we want the spirit to set us free so we can live our lives. I'm saying you can only be free by living in the life of the spirit. That's why the message is titled Living in the Freedom of Life. Life is freeing. Death is bondage. The law of life. Life sets you free. You live in the freedom of life. As soon as we stop living in the life of the Spirit, we stop living in the freedom of his life. This is what Paul's describing. How to live the Christian life through the Holy Spirit of life. Now, I think this part of Christian living is hard for us to understand. Christian living can be put into three parts. The four parts, the do parts, and the with parts. <coughs> We're pretty good with the four part. We know what Christ did for us. He died for my sins. He became incarnate. He came to earth for me to reveal the life of God. He's coming back for us. We're the bride of Christ. There's all kinds of four parts in our faith, and we understand those parts. There's also do parts. Go, therefore, and make disciples. He who loves me will obey my commands. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. All these talk about things we do, don't they? The do parts. The four parts, the do parts, we're okay with. It's the with parts that we don't really get. What we do with him and what he does in us. Those are the parts I want to share with you this morning, okay? And so there's three things I want to share with you about the with parts of our Christian life. The first is this. You need to recognize the power of life. <coughs> In Judges chapter 6, verse 14, back to Gideon. Remember Gideon two weeks ago? Overcoming the Gideon syndrome? The Gideon syndrome was letting what happened to you define you rather than what God says of you define you. And how when the angel showed up, when Gideon was in hiding, the angel greeted him as a mighty man of valor. We got all that. Now the story goes on from there. The very next thing the angel says to Gideon is this. Go in the strength you have. As long as we're convinced the strength we have is not strong enough to go in, we'll stay put in our problems. If God would just, and then we add in something we want God to do before we go. Go in the strength you have. You've got enough strength, Gideon. Go, 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 go in the strength you have. Get started in the strength you have. But when you're born again, and the law of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. You didn't know it at that time. <coughs> More happened to me the night I got saved than I realized what happened to me. It's taken a lifetime. Thank you. It's taken a lifetime to continue to learn what happened to me when I got saved. That's the way it is with Gideon. Gideon. He was more than he thought, that God had made work, had done work in him greater than he realized, but he didn't know it, and so he had to get going in the strength that he had. You go in the strength you have. You've got strength that you have by being born again. The law of life has set you free. Now, Paul in Romans is trying to get us to see this strength, and one of the ways he does it is he compares it with a power that we're all familiar with. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, Paul does something that no self-respecting evangelical would ever do. He compares sin to grace, or grace to sin. Take your pick. It goes both ways. Verse 20, 
But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That's where we stop in our thinking. And we say, where there is sin, there's going to be more grace. But Paul goes on to make an analogy of comparison. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, even so is comparing now, sin and grace. Even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many times have you read that verse and never noticed the two words, grace reigns? We think of grace as a possibility and not as a ruler or a power. Paul is comparing the reign of sin and the reign of grace. Now, they are different in character, and I'm going to explain how. But right now, he's trying to get us to see that sin was a power in your life. You know, when I was a sinner, we never really had recommitment meetings. I never went to one sinner revival. No one handed out flyers. Think about it. Because sin was a power that ruled our lives. We just lived our lives under the rule of sin. Then we get saved and we keep trying to stir up grace. Because we think it's just a possibility and not a power. We don't understand it as a power yet in our lives. And so we keep trying to stir up something that God has already given us. You know, to pray for what God has already given you is to start in unbelief. And that's where we start. Paul is in faith. He says, listen, I know what it's like to live under the reign of sin. And I want you to know that I'm living now under the reign of grace. That as sin was a power that shaped my desires and controlled my life. Now grace is a power that will shape my desires and empower me to do God's will. In fact, Paul writes about this in other verses. Once you see it, you're going to see several of his statements where he describes this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, quoting it from the New Living Bible. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, I know you're looking at the peanut butter sandwich. We're going to get into the theology of peanut butter in a moment. See, grace reigns. He compares it to sin, but there's also a difference. Sin's reign is coercive. Grace reign is cooperative. Okay? Grace creates in you the desire to do God's will. I know you're all really good people, and I'm sure you're all better people than me. But I also know none of you would be here if it weren't for the grace of God putting the desire in you to walk closer to Jesus Christ. I know that. Grace has put desire in you to follow Christ because no one made you come. That's a great thing about church, it's voluntary. You're here because you wanna be. And all you people online, you're watching because you want to. No one makes you. And you're wanting to grow in grace because God's putting the desire in you. That's how grace works. It starts creating desires in us. And then when we respond, God rewards. And you know what that does? That creates more desire. And that's why I liken the grace of God and his work in us to a peanut butter sandwich. (laughs) I'm going over here so someone can move the camera. If you want to follow me, pick up this table. (laughs) I'm coming back now. I'm here. Thank you. I had to do that because I needed both hands to talk. Here's how grace works. The first piece of bread, desire and power, God puts it there. Then you respond out of in obedience because God put the desire in you to please Christ and he gives you the power through the Holy Spirit to do it, you're like the peanut butter on the bread. And then God gets so excited that he rewards you and says, well done. You did the desire according to the power that I put in you, but you did it with me 
I am so excited, I'm going to reward you, reward you. That's the second piece of bread. You're the peanut butter between desire and reward. You follow that? Your whole life is a peanut butter sandwich in Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like peanut butter. Now, for those of you who actually want to read more in-depth theology on this, you can read the 12th century Bernard of Clairvaux. He wrote Grace and Free Will, a monk. You can get it for 99 cents on Kindle. Or you can read Martin Luther's Bondage of the Will, Jonathan Edwards' Freedom of the Will, John Wesley's Notes on Prevenient Grace, or you can read the Calvinists who write about irresistible grace. They're all writing about how the grace of God works on the will and I have to be honest with you, there's a bit of mystery to this whole thing. Because God can take the unwilling and make them willing. Now, the Calvinists see this, and they call that irresistible grace, which I don't like the name, and I don't even believe in what they're describing. But basically, they're saying that grace overcomes your resistance, therefore it's irresistible. You get the idea. I think there's a point where you respond to the grace of God. And there is an interaction of grace and you together. Uh, the only analogy of this I could give to you is ice dancing with Torval and Dean. And if you've never seen them ice dance, Google it. Go to YouTube. Watch Torval and Dean ice dance. He leads, she follows, but you can't tell where the leading and the following begin and end. They just are together. It's a dance. The grace of God is more of a dance than it is a drill sergeant commanding you, march, and then you march, stop, and then you stop. That's what religion does to it. It's a dance of grace. And so I don't go with the irresistible grace. I like what John Wesley called prevenient grace. That's a term no normal person uses. And, and it means grace precedes every one of your actions, permeates your actions, and rewards your actions. So you're the peanut butter between desire and reward, but even the peanut butter is saturated with grace. That's why Paul said oh, it redounds to the glory of God when we obey, because it's a work of grace acting on the will. This is the reign of grace through the law of life in Christ Jesus, and that's why you're here. You have been set free from the law of sin and death, or you would not be here. Because sin would rule over your life. And you'd go to those sinner revivals. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? It's a power, not just a possibility. And until we understand grace as a power, we will think of it as giving us forgiveness. But then if we really want to, we can obey, but we never really want to. And we stumble and we go back for more forgiveness. And we never really understand the power of grace to transform us and set us free. This is what Paul is describing, a transforming power of grace that's so uniform and universal that he uses the word law to describe it so it applies to you. This is for you. You are not the exception. There are no exceptions to the law of life in Christ Jesus to those who are born again. Well... Barely see the clock. Don't know why I bothered looking. The second thing I want to talk about is nourishing the power of life. Romans chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. These are verses that we equate more with the, the do part than the with part. But I want to look at them as the with part of Christianity and not the do part. Okay? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That means lip service. The, the Greek word's the idea of mouthing. <laughs> In other words, we sing choruses and then do what we want. Okay? Uh, God is not mocked. You're not going to give God lip service and then go sow to the flesh and reap life. That's the point Paul's making. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let's just talk about reaping because that's where the life comes down to. Those who sow to the flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. He doesn't say you shall 
reap the judgment of God. He says, you shall from your own flesh reap corruption. I think we Christians are pretty quick to use the phrase, God's going to judge. Okay? <clears throat> God is so patient. My goodness. I can't believe what he puts up with. <laughs> That's a fact. I can't believe what he puts up with. I don't have enough faith to believe what he puts up with. And therefore, I'm more than willing to pronounce judgment before he's done putting up with it. And Christians do that all the time. Paul's not saying if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap judgment from God. He's saying it's just going to come from your own flesh. Most of what we call judgment is really self-exclusion on our part. And the same with non-Christians who reject the gospel and judge themselves worthy of, uh, unworthy of eternal life are those who choose a lifestyle of disobedience, who exclude themselves from the kingdom of God. They all say, well, you're telling me God's going to judge me? You don't have to. You're judging yourself. It's a judgment of self-exclusion. And here, Paul's simply saying, you're going to reap the corruption from your own flesh. You still have your flesh. So isn't God bringing judgment? Nor is it the devil. And, and uh, <clears throat> please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not here to defend the devil. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But sometimes we say, you know, it's the devil harassing me. When it really is just you. Now, he's taking advantage of it, no doubt about it. So I'm not here to defend him, but it's just you. You know, if you sow stress in your life, you could reap an ulcer. Now you can blame it on the devil, or you can say, God's judging me. But it's just you, mostly. This is what Paul's saying. Now, don't be deceived about this. When Paul says don't be deceived, he's about ready to tell us something that is an area where we're common in our deception. I remember Linda and I were walking into, I think it was C.J. Muggs restaurant in Webster. I doubled over on the sidewalk in shooting pain. I felt like uh, I'd been stabbed. <clears throat> Linda asked, what's the matter? I said, I think I'm passing a kidney stone. Gah! Went to the doctor. Doctors asked me all that was going on in my life. We was pastoring the church. I was in seminary. I was taking Hebrew. Hebrew is the, the my kids described Hebrew as the year that daddy lost his joy. <laughs> I don't really do languages well. I memorize well. And so when I do Hebrew, I would take this whole verb chart and I would memorize it. And I go to the teacher, I said, can I use the verb chart when you give translation? He said, you mean pull it out of the book? I said, no, recreate it from memory on a piece of paper and then use it in the test. He said, sure, like he never had that request before. <laughs> so I recreate it from memory and I would use it on the, on the test. Well, apparently the stress of Hebrew was getting the best of me. You know, you can push your body beyond where it wants to go. And I reaped it. And I don't think it was the devil. It may have been the Hebrew. <laughs> but I was reaping the stress of my life. You can reap marital strife just simply by sowing neglect. Yeah. Spend all your time doing other things and talking with your spouse and you have marital neglect. You don't have abuse. You're not, you're not cheating. You're not unfaithful. You're just trying to go to the next level in the video game. That's all. But you have marital neglect and you're reaping strife in your marriage. And you go, Pastor, the devil's really attacking my marriage. No, he's not. He didn't have to. You're doing his job. <laughs> You're just reaping what you sowed. <clears throat> but it also flips on the positive. You can reap from the Spirit life. Life affirming sowing. You'll reap peace when you sow trust. You know that? Our whole culture has been bound by the spirit of fear. I'm not living in denial of COVID and all the other stuff. I'm not a COVID denier. Okay? <laughs> But neither am I bound by fear. There's a spirit of fear. Fear is contagious. 
and it masquerades as security, but it does not produce trust. Where's the security? There's no security in fear. You're reaping the distress of it when you could be reaping peace if you would sow trust. You can reap harmony in your relationships if you will sow care. It works. Now, it isn't that the sowing produces the life. It just puts the seed in the ground like the farmer puts it in the ground, but God brings the increase, and that's the part that's with. We can't make it happen, but I tell you what, if you sow the right seed, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will cause it to bloom, and you will nourish the power of life in your life, and you have to nourish it. There's an old poem I guess it's a poem, maybe it's a saying. Doesn't hardly rhyme, but it goes like this. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Your destiny is being shaped by your thoughts today. Your thoughts are gonna produce actions and your actions are gonna produce habits and your habits are gonna produce a character in you. It's sowing and reaping. Nourish the life of the Spirit in you. And it will strengthen his life in you. And when I say it strengthens his life in you, I'm not saying the Spirit gets stronger. He's omnipotent. You can't get any stronger than omnipotent. Okay. You will get stronger in his omnipotence. And the one in you is omnipotent. That means he's got enough power with whatever you're facing. There's no one or nothing more powerful than the Holy Spirit. Third thing, and the last area we're going to look at, serve in the newness and the power of the newness of life. Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to that which we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. It's not the new way of the Spirit. It's the newness of the Spirit. So when you're saved, you get new life. And we think of that as an event. But Paul's describing something that's constantly being renewed. There is a newness of the Spirit. He never runs out of energy. He never gets tired. He's always going. There's a newness of life in the Holy Spirit. Have you ever known the Holy Spirit? Say, I'm tired. Imagine, just try to imagine this. We get to the end of this message this morning. And at the end of it, I say, anybody who wants to come forward for prayer, the altars are open, you you, you can come forward for prayer. And so you respond and you come forward for prayer and you you kneel at the altar (coughs) and you start to pray. And you're asking the Holy Spirit for help. And he says, I'm tired. You have no idea how much effort it takes to get Mike Peters to say something meaningful. (laughs) I'm exhausted. I'm just worn out with him. Give me some time to rest and then I can help out, okay? The newness of the spirit, he never gets tired. Have you ever known the Holy Spirit to not be happy about doing the work of Christ? I'm just burned out. I just think God wants me to quit. Yeah, yeah, you definitely warm out. I remember years back, Arthur Wallace saying to a gathering of pastors, if you're exhausted, it's because you're doing your work and not his. Have you ever known the Holy Spirit to not be happy about doing the work of Jesus? Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know when he said that? When he had a trowel in one hand building a wall and he had a sword in the other hand defending against his accusers. And he said, man, I'm having fun. This is great. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's when he wrote that. The Holy Spirit doesn't get worn out. Now, if you're tired and burned out, maybe you're doing his work or your work and not his. Are you're not working with him? <laughs> Have you ever known the Holy Spirit to accept partial obedience and say, that's good enough, you tried. I'll talk to Jesus, he'll understand. <laughs> Does he do that? 
Or does he say, I can help you bring it to perfection? Let's deal with it at its root. Serving in the newness of the spirit means you are serving in the power of life that never gets tired, is always happy, and ever ready to help with faith and obedience. That's what it means to live the Christian life. It's to serve in newness of life. Wow. Just in conclusion, let me share this with you. Living the Christian life, you can't do it. (laughs) It's not doable. Oh, no. You have to live it with his life. You can't live it on your own. There's a verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, actually. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. When we were saved, we weren't just given life. We were made alive together with Christ. You can't live the Christian life. You can only live it together with Christ, living in the freedom of his life. That's what it means to be a Christian, and that's how we live the Christian life. It's how we start. It's how we are to continue alive together with him, living in the freedom of his life. Now, if you'd like that kind of life, let's pray. And if you've already received Christ and you want to grow in that kind of life, let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you teach us how to live the Christian life together with Christ. We can't do it on our own. I see people wear out daily who think it's about willpower and desire of their own. They have reduced it to a religion. And God save us from that. When you saved us, You brought us into a relationship with one who is risen from the dead, conquering the very power of death. Holy Spirit, I pray that we would learn how to live with you in the power of life, overcoming the power of sin and death, to live in that freedom with such joy and energy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen, Lord. Amen. As musicians play, pray, play. If you want to pray, you can come forward to the altars. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe it's just something you've taken up. You're all stressed out about in your own strength and your own willpower. <laughs> oh, let it go. Trust God. Let His grace work through you and in you to transform you, but also. Whatever is of him in all that you may be stressing about, he'll he'll handle it with you. You can trust him. It's there for you. And so you can come forward and pray. Those of you who are at home, you're also, you can pray right, right where you are. God's grace can be there too. The Lord bless you. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with those of you who are online. For those of us who are here, let's Wait on the Lord.